Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience and see wealth differently. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market leading technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your business thrive. See wealth differently. Visit netwealth.com.au to learn more about how NetWealth can support you. Welcome back to the XY Advisor podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and we are continuing with our technology and innovation series. And in this episode, we're really focusing in on content marketing. And content marketing has become a big, big piece of the technology and innovation stack over the last few years. And so we're going to get stuck into all things that advisors are doing around content marketing. Welcome back, Patrick Flynn. Great to be back. Thank you, Fraser. Fantastic for being here. We're talking about content marketing and all all things around content marketing from, you know, what, what do you create and how do you create it and how do you promote it and all those <laughs> sorts of things. What what are you seeing from an overall uh, perspective in this uh, content marketing space? Well, where I see it working really nicely is when it's really genuinely considered an end-to-end part of the client journey. It's not just, I'm going to have to go source some articles I'm just going to go get some, you know, pay someone to give me some articles and it doesn't really build into anything else. When it does build into everything else, then when you get to the next step, which is really it's not just about getting people to sign up to a newsletter or getting people to schedule a meeting with you, that's pretty cringe. You know, where we where it works really nicely is when that content marketing really supports your advice process, speaks to your advice process, speaks to the words, the key concepts and stuff like that. um, So that when somebody has listened to a bunch of your stuff and they've heard you frame things the way you want to frame them, then when they sit down in front of you, they're like, oh, yep, cool. This is what I've heard before, read before, et cetera. For example, I write some blogs and I do some videos on LinkedIn and I'll often refer people back to those same videos or blogs and I'll use the language that's in those blogs in my meetings. And then content marketing isn't just about getting some opt-ins. It's really about building engagement genuinely so that when people come to see you, they're not seeing you for a first appointment. They're really saying when they come in the door, I already get you. I understand what you do. That's why I'm here. I already trust you. Just tell me how your wisdom applies to my situation, which means that you're getting one one new business appointment uh, instead of two or three because you've already skipped out so much of the process by doing it at scale over time. Yep. Uh, you, you spoke to the, the the authenticity of the uh, of the person providing the content, which is probably why it's so important that people are creating content that resonates with them and their ideal market. Um, but you also sort of mentioned now what from what I was gathering is that this needs, you know, your content marketing or your strategies around that need to be part of a bigger process. Yeah, absolutely. So if you, I'm a process guy. I think about everything in terms of process. So if you are talking about something, um, one one content, uh, one uh, uh, concept I often use uh, is the three word slogan. So I often refer to uh, Tony Abbott as, you know, like him or love him or hate him, whichever it is, it's probably one of the two. Um, but, you know, whatever your opinion of him is, um, he was really good at getting messages out. So when he said, stop the boats or ax the tax, you know, I can tell you these things. It's been a number of years since he was elected, but they still resonate because they were just repeated so consistently. And that was done as part of a process. So if we are saying, you know what, our advice process maybe consists of six things. And you know, whatever those six things are, let's say it's, you know, get your cash flow sorted first. You know, so you might call that cash is key. Um, and then we go, all right, every time we talk, we talk about cash is king, and then step number two, step number three, whatever it might be. Um, and if you 
if you're really confident in your advice process and you're really confident about the stuff that you're saying in your meetings and you document that, then you can start building that all out into all of your content so that you're taking clients down the journey before they've even spoken to you. I've sat down with advisors who have said, Pat, Pat, listen, every meeting I go through this and I do this thing and clients love it. And I feel it really explains that concept really well. And I'll say, excellent. Does that exist anywhere else in the universe? What do you mean? Is it on your website? Do you have materials? Do you give them a flyer that speaks to that? Uh, Do you have content marketing that speaks to that? Oh, no, 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 no. It's just something I say in meetings, every single one. Um, It's like, well, okay, let's just take those things and consider that's an important part of our process and let's build that into everything that we do. And then it's all self-supporting and every little bit interrelates to every other little bit. When we start thinking about that as being content marketing, that's what I think about typically when I think of, of the process that underpins what the content is. Then the other parts of the process is about the how and why and when. Um, so, for example, um, I typically uh, do one video a week. We typically post that on a Tuesday. It depends a little bit on you know how busy I've been and whatnot. And sometimes I'll record three in a day, and then sometimes I'll um, won't record anything for a couple of weeks. Most weeks I get one. You know, if you've got a strategy and a plan for that, then that can do wonders for helping you produce that content. If you use somebody external to be a little bit of a ghostwriter, I think that can be a good strategy because they'll keep you honest as well. When I say ghostwriter, I mean somebody who's collaborative with you. You might explain that same thing in every meeting, but the ghostwriter helps put some really nice words to that, a nice structure to that, even though the concept is still yours as opposed to someone where you just buy stuff off the shelf. But if you've got a plan, you say, we're going to do these things this often, these are the sorts of things we do on this channel, these things we do on that channel, it can be really good. It might be our staff member, you know, has a five-year anniversary or a 10-year anniversary or, you know, whatever. We might post that on Facebook because that's an appropriate medium for that. It's also nice. It shows that you've got some longevity. Somebody put up with your grief for five years or 10 years um, and, you know, they'll be around for a a long time. So it's a really nice little thing to post on social media as a bit of signaling, Um, but it might not be the right content for LinkedIn, but you've got a trigger. In my business, when this happens, I do this. When I get a really good testimonial from a client, here's the process. Ask them if I can post it. Ask them for a Google review. Get the, you know, whichever of those suits best to whichever medium, post it to those sorts of things. New team member joins the business. At week two, after they've settled in, we do this. Building all these little processes into a a content plan um, can be very, very effective. Yeah, fantastic. It's, uh, you're absolutely right, having a structured plan in place. And it's not, not easy to, to put together, I guess. So it does create some time and effort and energy uh, putting those content plans together. I'm sure you know uh, a lot about that, Fraser. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I do. Uh, now, talk to me about the um, the concept. Of, well, as you said, um, I'm thinking, I'm reading between the lines that you're suggesting we put uh, the website should be the hub for that content uh, and oh, then the absolutely. distribution channels being, you know, the social or however we get them out. Yeah, so firstly, the website's going to be the thing that you own at the end of the day, Um, unlike any other social media platform that can change an algorithm or or whatever the case may be, or just straight up shut down, go offline, etc. And, you know, you're beholden to them. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't use those platforms, but they shouldn't be the centre. When you get somebody to your website, you can then gradually introduce them to the, the calls to action that you want them to take. So... Uh, One thing that um, I've heard from a guy, uh, he runs a company based in Melbourne SEO company called King Kong. And uh, I'm paraphrasing here because he uses some cruder language than I do. But asking a client to call and make an appointment is like trying to sleep with somebody on the first date. And you're not trying to sleep with somebody on the first date. You're just trying to get to first base. Um, So if we think about it in those terms, the analogy can be fairly apt um, because if We're just saying, call us, inquire, fill out the inquiry form, book a time with us. That's really daunting to most people. And unless they've already come to your website as a very warm lead, then they're unlikely to do that. However, if you say, hey, I'm going to give you some value today, opt in, and you're going to get 
our, our six-step plan to fixing your financial situation, then one, you're offering something of value, which is always good. And secondly, you're making that step really small. Okay. It does take a little bit of trust to hand over my email address and I don't do it for nothing. It actually does require an exchange of value, um, but they're giving me something in return. Cool. And I know what I'm getting into. I know I'm probably going to get some emails to that'll follow on from that. And then you can follow that on with a, a drip feed campaign or something like that. Um, but that's all you're looking to do. You're just trying to get to first base. And if you do that with your website and then you drive everything else back to your website, be it for your ongoing content, when you have that conversation with a client about something that you've got a uh, reference to, you're sharing that that's on your website, you're booking appointments on your website, they're logging into their client portal via your website, then they're used to coming back there. They're used to knowing what your website is. They're used to engaging you with that in that way. You're controlling your brand every step and you're making yourself eminently referable because they've got that confidence in your website and people will refer typically by sending a link to your website or unless it's intra-platform, like they're on Facebook and they're referring to you, they'll link to your Facebook, which will then link to your website. So either by secondhand or firsthand, it'll be coming back to your website in any case. And that should be something that every one of your existing clients has been to since they signed up. But for most practices, once a client's joined, they don't expect that they've ever visited your URL in any capacity ever. Yeah, so it's certainly a big, uh, big thing to consider. Hey, uh, Patrick, thanks so much for coming on this episode. We look forward to catching you in the next one. Cheers. Thanks for joining me again, Hallie Pierce. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. Now we're talking about all different things regarding content marketing from both, you know, targeting new clients, which I guess you don't do a lot of in your practice because you you have a different way of bringing on new clients, but also around the concept of you know you do a lot of work with. Um, personalizing, um, uh, when I say personalizing, I mean like understanding the, the client base and the segmentation to be able to send um, communications to those types of people. Tell us about, uh, you know, the nurturing, I guess, process within your within your, what you're doing. Yeah, so we have our, our Caboodle question times, which is our live stream. Um, we are also sending out regular newsletters. Now, uh, we're actually looking at ripping this this process apart a bit. So I know newsletters are a hard thing for people because they don't know what to put in there. Uh, we we were using a lot of the information that is the in the financial knowledge center provided by Energy. I know you recently spoke with Rob. Such such a great tool. Uh, we for every client that came on board, we signed them up. They loved the co- the concept of it. We shared the articles in our newsletters. Great read rate, but no one logged in again there was not a second login. And that's because um, that particular portal didn't suit how our clients were engaging via information. So when we shared that content, they engaged, but they didn't actively seek it out. So it was a really great lesson for us then to how we how we engage with people, how we sharing our content. Uh, when we did our caboodle question times, we chopped that information up and then we just put it in short short sections and drip fed that out through our newsletter as well. So whoever didn't attend was able to capture small bits of information. So we're learning along the way. Um, It's one of those things where you share some information, you don't, you know, crickets. So we don't share that sort of thing again. But then there's stuff like the password management or the cybersecurity where it's gangbusters, send me more. I'd love to hear more about that. And so that's where we really lean into that sort of thing. Yep. Now with the um, Caboodle question time, where do these questions come from? Well, what are you answering? Uh, People submit them. So we've got some questions that people will just send in um, after the APRA performance report. We had, you know, of course, phone calls. So we straight away that day, uh, the other two advisors and myself jumped on and recorded a 10 minute breakdown of what that meant. And we got that out to clients straight away. Naturally, people had more questions. So we popped that in our Caboodle question time. Then we cover off on just some some stuff that we feel is topical at the moment. So power of attorneys we, we spoke about recently. Um, we'll always do a money habit section, you know, something small that you can do to help with your managing your finances. We always try to do a little bit of something that's not related to finance. Um, and we've just found that, you know, keeping them to 30 minutes, um, keeping, you know, about four topics to a webinar, it was really good engagement. Yeah, amazing. So now with this webinar, are you running them live or are you pre-recording them? And is the conversation between the you and the other advisors? 
Yep. So it's live. Uh, Peter Diamantidis, the the head of Caboodle, she she hosts it, and myself and one of the other advisors will will talk through different topics. And it's very casual. It's very conversational. Minimal slides, minimal numbers on the screen. It's it's probably similar to this format, just general conversation. And I think people like that a bit more as opposed to slides with returns and market things. Like people don't, not all people engage with that, not our clients. And I also find it's interesting that, um, you know, if, you, if you're staying away from market conditions and things that are completely relevant to the now, then this content can be repurposed over time. Definitely. And that's what we've been doing, as I said, just chopping it up and sharing it throughout newsletters. Um, the other benefit has been, you know, the section we did on power of attorneys, whenever we interact with a client and, and identify that we need to connect with their power of attorney, we send them that snippet to that video that we that we had spoken about in the caboodle question time. And it just really sinks in why we're, why we're asking for this information. Similarly, if someone's not returning their risk profile questionnaire, we've got the section where we talked about risk and return. So it would be great to have this catalog of, of videos that were really clean and schmick and professional and covered off on all the perfect things. But sometimes just the general conversation with a bit of background, you know, that's enough to get the message through to the, to the client. Yeah, let's go into this a little bit deeper. The the because a lot of people do think that videos need to be, like you said, schmick and professionally polished. Talk to me about how how just an authentic video of you sitting uh, in your house in a room makes you know can be just as good as a you know something that's that's being professionally you know professionally it, done. Yeah, it's worth its weight in gold. And honestly, it was it was a roadblock of mine. Uh, I've got all the bells and whistles here to do videos for clients, and I had the longest list of ideas to create them. And I felt that I had to have, you know, the the background, the animation, I had to have the color scheme, I had to have it all perfect. And that was the roadblock. I just, it took me six months to get onto it. And then I realized they don't care. They care about what I'm saying and the fact that I'm just doing the video. And as soon as I got over that, it made life so much easier. Um, at times where I needed to connect with clients regarding something, instead of picking up the phone, I just pop quickly did a video. So if, if we have a list of clients that just don't respond to their reviews, now we're encouraging them, look, you're paying us, get your review done. We know life happens. We've started just doing a short video that says, hey, there's some red flags here we need to talk about. Um, I need you to schedule in a time. And we've had 100% success rate on that. Because it's a bit like going to the principal's office, <laughs> you know. If if our client guide rings and says, "Oh, you haven't booked in your review, you really need to," they don't care. But if they, if it comes from me and they can look me in the eyes, so to speak, it just has it makes a world of difference. Yeah, amazing. Now, when you're doing videos that you want to repurpose and reuse, where, where and how are you storing them, and then how do you be able to find them and send them to the next client? Yeah, so we we've just been storing them in like uploading them to YouTube and then sharing the links. Um, we are talking about creating a client only portal on our website where we might keep some of this information, but the jury's out on me for client portals. I just I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer. I feel like within the industry we think we have to have one. Um, it's like having an app and I think unless it solves a problem or there's a journey, I don't know why we would have one. And I think because there's so many different clients out there, how do you make one app suit so many people? You know, if I tailor this up to the person who's going to look at their balances every week, who wants to dive into the investment options, that's going to be markedly different to the client who's going to look at it once a year, five minutes before their review call. Yeah. So I think there's there's some great there's some great tools out there. Um, I just, I, I think, you know, having a portal where you can ref, reference things is, in, is helpful, but I don't know how far it's going to go in encouraging clients to regularly log in and see what your sum insured is. Like, I don't know that people care. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? The, uh, the, 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 with the concept, it all comes back down as you said before, you know, that regular, is somebody actually regularly going to log into something just because you've created it? Hayley, thanks so much for coming and chatting to us on this episode. We look forward to catching you in the next one. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome back, James. Hey, how are you going? Very well. Thank you for joining us. Now, we're talking about uh, content marketing in this particular episode. We're talking about all things to do with having a content marketing. It's probably, let's, let's start with the plan idea. Let's start with having a content marketing plan. How are you working with, with groups that, uh, with, that have a good plan? Yeah, uh, well, I've seen 
several firms now who actually have a 12 month plan where they, and they've broken it up into quarters. This quarter is around superannuation, particularly leading through that um, uh, April, May, June period. And then leading to Christmas, they may have um, more areas around uh, a plan around budgeting. So as they lead into Christmas, there's more budgeting topics. And is, that some, is that something that's come from somewhere, just an idea, or is that some, is, is it where there's some Google analytics behind any of that? No Google analytics that I know of. No, no, it's more just, this is what we want to concentrate on. It's more just keep, getting the focus to having that focus of like, let's work on this area for that period of time yep. so that um, uh, there's a, th- there's a theme for want of a better word during yep. that time. Yep. And so quarterly, quarterly type themes, is that what you're seeing? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I've seen some firms do monthly, you know, so they may, it really depends how much um, social or, or um, media you're trying to create. Yep. And, uh, and with, with content, obviously there's content marketing as in with, you know, we're trying to get that word out to new people, but there's also the branding concept as well and, and looking after your existing clients and nurturing your existing clients. Just go back to the plan idea, having a plan in place, setting out a plan, how do you suggest people sort of go about that and then look at then what distribution channels you use? Yeah, well, I think it's number one, it's the type of firm that you, get, that you are. Are you working in the retiree market or the retirement market? Are you working in the millennial? It just it really depends on what what your practice or firm is concentrating on. So, uh, if you if if you work in the retirement market, more than likely you're going to pretty much use Facebook versus LinkedIn, purely because there's more people on Facebook than there are on, if, in that market than there are on LinkedIn. Uh, if, if obviously if you work in the professional market, definitely you'd look at something like LinkedIn. If you're looking at the millennial market, you could, you could look at the Instagrams as well as the Facebook, or even dare I say TikTok. <laughs> You've said TikTok a couple of times. Come on. Are you on TikTok? I am on TikTok. <laughs> Have I posted one yet? No. <laughs> Do I find it hugely entertaining? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you'll be looking out for, for your advice uh, practices on TikTok. Um, t- t- talk to me about, so, uh, marketing schedules and plans what what are the sort of things that you see working when it comes to content because obviously sometimes it's just rubbish being published but uh, what what yeah. works for content well i think firms are now employing looking to employ either contract people to do this or actually in house and they are then able to either guide the practice or focus the practice on what what needs to happen because everyone gets in the in the business of being busy, um, and I will leave that for another week. Leave that for another week it happens quite often, and uh, before you know it, six weeks, two months have passed, or even more, and there's no been no updated post on their on their um, blog page or on their Facebook page yep. or any other area they may be using. It feels to me like this is a specialist area that find somebody who really either loves doing it or or outsource it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah. put something in place, put some, some funding, some time, some resources in place to say, right, that is, that is what we're going to do, create a proper plan and then work out your distribution channels and yeah. send stuff I know, out. I know very few business owners that actually either A, have a giant love for it or B, have the time to be able to do it. Yeah, one of the one of the things I think uh, I see businesses doing well, the content marketing is also the um, reviews, getting good Google reviews back in. Yep. And um, uh, asking clients on a regular basis, having um, a thank you gift or whatever it might be to be able to, you know, Google reviews, LinkedIn reviews, um, even advisor ratings reviews. Yep. And uh, have you worked with anyone that's doing paid advertising with regards to their content plant? Uh, no, I haven't actually at the moment. Mm. No. It seems to be, uh, it seems to be a, a, a little... Uh, worked on subject for for most practices. It would be nice if Google was nice and transparent about uh, how how they um, how they're pricing some keywords these days. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Now they're keeping they're keeping the industry going by keeping everyone on, the, on their toes when it comes yes. to um, uh, uh, those search engines. Uh, talk to us about um, you know uh, creating or content and then promoting it and repurposing it and what are you seeing in that space? Advisors doing well, a good job. Um, you mentioned videos earlier. I'm sort of thinking around, you know, what the video or podcast market are doing. Not many people. I'm not working with any firms at the moment that are using video. And I think that's got a long way to go. Uh, there's been, what, 
you can I can remember the discussion around video started probably around 2012. We're now nine years later and we're nowhere near the opportunity with regards to video. What about podcasting? <laughs> podcasting, yes. <laughs> Subject so close to your heart and mine. Yeah, you know, I, I subscribe to a range of even um, other advice firms podcasts. There are, and I think anything you need to do to give the opportunity for clients to be able to share it or listen to it. Um, I think we, we we think very much around the listen, but we don't think a lot around the sharing. Hey, listen to this; it's, it's worthwhile. You know, it's a sharing of those of those numbers. And I think somebody put it interestingly to me the other day, where I said, you know, you may only get fifty or a hundred downloads on a particular podcast, but a lot of people would love to be able to get into a room and talk to that many people on a regular basis for the cost of a podcast. Yep. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's not necessarily about the numbers. It's about the, the quality over the quantity. We're not, to, we're not there to be Joe Rogan. We are there yeah. to, to, you know, run generally most, most advisors are in the advice business. So that's their job. Uh, and getting in front of 50 people a week is a, is a pretty good uh, thing. Yeah. James, thanks so much for coming on to this particular episode. We look forward to catching you in the next one. My pleasure. See you, man. Welcome back, Cara Graham. Hi, thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you here. Now, we're talking about content marketing and and, uh, and doing all the things around producing content. And, and, and I know you've got some special uh, comments to make around reviews. Uh, so let's get let's jump into it. What, uh, what I mean, I know you're not specifically doing it in your business, but tell us about what your business is doing in the way of sort of its outbound marketing. Mm. I, I mean, generally speaking, we we are a word of mouth business. You know, that is generally how we get most of our, our clients from other clients from our referral partners. But obviously, we want to make sure that anything that the client sees before they they meet us or, or after they meet us is of a really high quality and positions us. Uh, in the right way, you know, professional, um, you know, capable, confident and, and, you know, adding value to their circumstances. So, you know, we've always focused quite a lot on having, you know, beautiful uh, and easy websites or sites, a few different divisions to our business. Um, we have had a project over the last 12 months around Google reviews. So if you'd looked at our Google reviews 12 months ago, TWD, I think, had one or two reviews on there we just never really made it much of a focus and then we started a project just before Christmas last year and we just started asking clients for reviews and said hey you know you've always said such lovely things to us in our meeting do you mind just spending a moment going online um, and writing it as a review and we had an amazing response from clients um, you know it's, it's actually really heartwarming sometimes as well when you when you read those things because not everybody says how grateful they are but sometimes when they're given that opportunity to sort of put it into words it, it's just amazing and it's a really good reminder of why you do you do what you do so we you know we've got um i don't know the number off the top of my head but we've got a lot of google reviews now mostly five stars um and you know lots of beautiful comments and even i was chatting to um somebody that was referred to me the other day and i you know, gave them a little spiel about TWD and our process and what would come next. And I said, do you have any other questions? And they said, oh, no, I don't have any questions. You know, I had did some due diligence before the call and, you know, TWD looks great. You've obviously got lots of happy, happy clients that you work with at the moment. So feeling really comfortable about moving ahead. Um, and I, I think it was just a great project to go through it because, you know, if somebody gets given two names, two different advisors and they look them up and, you know, what's the first thing you do? You Google everything these days. And if one has 65 star reviews and the other one has none, then I think it's just much easier to gravitate towards the one where people are saying good things in a public forum. That's for sure. Now I love, I love this concept for so many reasons. <laughs> one, what one is, um, one is it's great SEO, right? You're going to get – Google's going to say, well, that sounds like a great business without knowing and then push your, you know, your search engine optimization will, will pop up, you know, when your business will pop up, you know, if somebody's looking locally or if somebody's looking for, um, you know, typing in the keywords. But what the other thing is reviews from a, from a consumer point of view, there is this element that it could be a bad review. Like if you write testimonials on your website, you're only going to put the good ones on there, right? But if, <laughs> But Google, you know, oh, here's a one-star testimonial. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, but uh, with Google reviews, there is that possibility 
that there could be a unhappy, and we're all craving that one or that you know is there is there somebody unhappy? We're kind of looking at the good ones, going, oh yeah, that's nice, that's nice, but I don't care about nice. I'm I'm, I'm looking for the one stars, and if there's no one stars, then that's brilliant, obviously. Um, but there's from the consumer point of view, I think that's what we tend to do when we when we focus in on Google reviews. We're looking for the the negative comments. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know, you know, when I go to a restaurant and I'm booking a hotel or something, I normally look at the last few and then I find a bad one. And then I says to myself, okay, is this person reasonable? Or, you know, were they were they maybe just getting a little bit worked up over something that, that wasn't, wasn't so bad? And, it, you know, I mean, we do have a couple of one-star reviews on there. Um, and I, I think they were actually um, from people that weren't clients. Uh, you know, the name the names weren't even familiar to us. But you know, I think I think it's an impossible target to have a hundred percent happy clients in a business where you just really can't always control the outcomes. Um, but certainly, you want to make sure the vast majority of people are having a great experience. And and likewise as well, if anybody doesn't have a great experience or some of these people that pass through you that aren't even clients, then you do have the ability to respond and react. You know, was their comment reasonable? Was it unreasonable? Did they not even know us and just, you know, are acting like a bit of a troll? Um, you know, unfortunately, their trolls exist. <laughs> Yes, and I think Google know that too. They uh, they tend to they tend to favour. I think they tend to favour, from what I've heard, more around that four and a half star of being a, a great number, not uh, mm. not necessarily just you know ten five star reviews, uh, which probably anybody can uh, can create if they if they feel like it. Uh, now, obviously, you mentioned that that word of mouth is a is a huge part of what you're doing, but you know you're absolutely right that clients will even if they've been referred or or there there is some sort of form of relationship there, they they definitely want to. Um, they definitely want to go and see some of your content online, or, or understand some articles you've written, or have a look at your website. Um, when you get clients coming in, even if they're referred, they have they been checking out some of your content? Yeah, I mean, certainly some of them. Yes, um, you know, from there in the past. Um, you know, we've prepared some some white papers on different niche areas. So sometimes they might have seen some of the, you know, um, printed or digital content about some of the white papers. We've got some around divorce, mining executives, um, small business owners and things along those lines. And, and you know, say articles, for example, you know, certainly I've written some articles and put them on LinkedIn. It hasn't been a major focus of mine. Um, but Troy, who's the, the founding partner within TWD, he does sort of regularly, uh, you know, write some articles for the West Australian and the like from there. But it, I guess it's one of those things it's, we've found it a little bit difficult to track say where introductions have come from come from those articles whereas say when it comes from say you know a google review or a referral partner again it's just a little bit easier to track from there but i think it's just you know all of that content it's around credibility you know when people are, are you know often given a name or they're coming across a name and they're trying to make a decision do i go and speak to this person or do i go and speak to that person it, it's about making sure that we've got the right credibility and we're going to have a connection with them you know, different advisors are going to suit different people. So somebody that, say, is coming to me might want, um, you know, somebody who's got an experience dealing with their type of situation or that they feel that we've got, you know, a connection and we're going to get along and they're going to trust my advice and, and things along those lines. And there'll be other people that would be much better suited to other advisors, and that's fine. Um, you know, from there, you know, we just want our our content online and our presence online to represent us and who we are as a business and also as individuals um, because it's a pretty personal relationship when you're engaging an advisor. You know, you need to make sure that obviously you're working with, with the right person. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I like that word credibility. And I think you mentioned earlier that, you know, professional, capable and confident. Uh, has that been part of your branding guide since the beginning? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, our sort of branding has, evolved a little bit over the years I'll, I'll sort of put it that way um, you know I think one of the branding lessons we've probably learned over the last few years is that we want to make um, you know our brand because we've got a few different areas of the business right from the you know the ultra high net worth um, you know and the mum and dad sort of type type business we just want to make sure that we you know are professional and come across as very capable but we're also accessible we don't want to make um, make people feel excluded. We don't want our brand to necessarily be elitist um, because we do have quite a, a broad market 
that we that we work with and that we market towards. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Cara, thanks for coming on and, ch- and chatting us today uh, regarding this particular topic of content marketing and marketing in general. Uh, we look forward to catching you very soon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us again, Matt Heiner. Thanks, Fraser. Fantastic. We're talking about content marketing in this in this particular episode. You sort of mentioned it in the first one. It's such an important uh, part of an advisor's process. Talk to us about what you're seeing in the content marketing space. Absolutely. And I, I love talking about content on a podcast, which is becoming a prolific uh, point of difference for advisors now. We're seeing new podcasts that are popping up on Apple Store every day. So uh, good to be back on the show. Um, content marketing is, is really important. Uh, it's um, becoming a key focus uh, and has been a key focus for our business for a long time. Um, and it's really important for, for a range of reasons. Uh, not only does it help you with prospects, so it helps you uh, really define yourself as the expert uh, in a particular field and on a particular topic. Um, but in this day and age when there's so much content available, um, people are getting bombarded you know, with content from everywhere. Um, I read a stat not that long ago that before we've even got to work, back in the day when we used to go to work, um, people on average would see about 5,000 different messages. Um, and so they're having to work through all of this this noise to work out who they trust and who they're going to listen to. So there's a real opportunity for financial advisors when it comes to obviously all things financial to cut through that noise and to become the trusted expert where uh, your clients and potentially prospects will come to you first to curate uh, the noise that's happening around them. So content's really important to uh, really distinguish yourself as an expert in the field. Um, but I think one of the other interesting things is that content um, often gets confused for social media or social media gets confused for content. Um, and I just want to really highlight that social media is a distribution platform or a way to amplify your content. So if you're going to go into content marketing, and I highly recommend it, and there's lots of different ways in which you can do it, it's all about making sure that you speak to your clients, you understand from your audience what's important to them, what is it they're going to be interested in because they don't have time to read stuff that's not. So once you've actually understood what the content is that your clients want and the format that they want to absorb it uh, in, so whether it's a podcast, a webinar, an article, um, a very short video, then you can start to think about social media as a distribution platform, but the content piece is, uh, is critical to get right first. Yeah, exactly right. You sort of start start with the. Uh, I always like to start with the. You know, the helping. How does this help my uh, particular you know listener or, or or your client or you know your avatar or whatever you want to call it? How do you pr- produce helpful content and then the distribution? You're right. The distribution is is, is an afterthought. Um, how important is it to have a, a plan around this though, and to spend some time actually planning this out and working out what you want to say, how you want to say it, what the problems are, what you're solving, all those sorts of things. It's clearly like uh, like many things. Planning is important. It's a it is hard to create regular good content, um, and I don't think we should shy away from that fact. But there are shortcuts, and there are ways to to make it easier. Um, so as we just touched on, really important. The first of all, um, you understand what your audience wants, um, but then as a business, you also need to understand, you know, what is the tone. What, what, what's the sort of the, the message um, that I'm wanting to portray about my, my brand? Uh, is it fun and lively? Is it very serious? Is it going to be market related or lifestyle related? Um, so you need to really uh, sort of understand, you know, how, how, what, how and what the tone is going to be. Once you've done that, it actually comes down to the content creation part. So again, understanding how your clients want to absorb it. We've talked about podcasts a little bit uh, and we're seeing a lot of people adopting podcasts. But one of the things that I love about podcasts and um, and part of the reason that I do one myself um, is that you can find fantastic guests that have got lots of really interesting things to say. So they actually become the content. Um, and what we do at NetWealth, and, and I highly recommend this to anyone that's um, thinking about a content plan, is start to interview BDMs, clients um, or other or business people on topics that are of interest to your audience. Do a 45-minute interview or an hour interview, have that transcripted, and then find someone that can actually turn that transcript into a whole range of articles. Uh, and that means that from what is effectively a 45-minute, one-hour discussion, which is easy to do, you can create three, four, five months' worth of content. Um, and it's a really good way, and, and we know that it works. So that, that's one way to do it. Uh, but you do need to come out with what we call one big idea, and that one big idea can then break off into lots of little sub content areas and uh, and make sure that you're planning at least three to six months ahead. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I love the content the conversation around evergreen um, content and repurposing it. Um, you know, when I think of um, 
when I think of content, I always try to make stuff that's going to be listened to in three or four months from now. Or like you said, if somebody turns into an article, somebody turns that into a, uh, you know, and then it finally makes a post somewhere along the line, people can still get some some relevance out of it. Uh, um, and I, I, I sort of um, talk to people around, you know, doing market updates and those sorts of things that uh, they're great, um, but they, uh, they're, they're relevant for a very short uh, space of time. Yeah, and, and making content uh, evergreen is actually quite challenging. Um, and it's important that if the plan is to make it evergreen, that you brief your guests. Uh, so we often see, um, particularly interviews with fund managers, there is a risk that they'll start talking about, you know, what's happening in the market this week or this month and what the greatest stock is. Um, try and avoid that. Try and, if you are going to do a market or an investment update, talk about the style, the value, um, the philosophy behind the investment, not actually what's happening in the market. Yep. Now, you mentioned one big idea. Talk to- Let's go a little bit more into that. What, what sort of what's an, what's a couple of examples of big ideas? Big ideas. Um, okay. Well, if we if we look at our content marketing strategy, um, and my colleague Andrew Braun um, is you know absolutely religious around this particular area, um, so we do a couple of big content themes every year. So there's typically four to five. Um, a great example would be the Advice Tech Report. Uh, so we go to market, we do the research, we collect a lot of data, uh, and off the back of that, we write a couple of white papers. Those white papers get turned into webinar series, they get turned into podcasts such as this one, um, and they get turned into presentations for clients and licensees. Um, so that's a great example where we can do, it is a, admittedly a very big bit of research, but it gives us content for three to four months. We then do another bit of research, which is around the Advisable Australian, which helps advisors and also us as a business uh, to understand you know, what the trends are. We'll then turn that into, uh, again, webinars, podcasts, uh, and information. Uh, and we do that three or four times a year, but uh, we're not have to constantly struggling to think of the next best idea or what are we going to talk about this week or this uh, this month. So um, I think that's a great example. Yeah, it's, it's well thought out and a lot of preparation put into it. And uh, consequently, the content, it becomes very helpful. Um, talk to us about the idea of once you've got some great content targeting or, or finding, you know, just the right ears and eyes and 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 you know those sort of things to, to to get in front of there's i mean there's obviously multiple ways you can do this um some people have got um a, a great client base and their whole content strategy is just around engagement they're not necessarily looking to grow or, or bring on new clients um and so that content is going to be quite different to the type of content that they might be generating if they were out there on facebook and advertising and, and trying to attract new clients that might be webinars or seminars uh, or some of those sort of things um so Again, it really comes down to, um, you know, with them, I think you touched on it before, what's in it for me? What is it that your clients are wanting to get out of this content and why are they going to dedicate their valuable minutes uh, to actually interacting or absorbing it? Yeah, I like to I like to say to uh, advisors that uh, just just choose your one best client, that your favourite client that you really love, and and do and do content for that uh, helpful content for that person, and 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 you never know, you might attract a whole lot of other clients just like that. Yeah, and you know, this is probably pretty obvious, uh, but there's no point sending a retiree an article that was written for millennials. Uh, because once they might accept it, but if they keep receiving articles about millennials that are of no relevance to them, they'll simply delete it, unsubscribe, or delete it when it comes in. Yep. And uh, what about, uh, um, we sort of haven't touched on this, but the idea of you know putting budget around this sort of stuff as well. Yeah, but budget, um, again, you could spend a lot of money or you could do it very uh, cheaply, as we mentioned. So um, putting aside an hour a month to do an interview with a fund manager or a client, as we've talked about, isn't going to cost you a lot. Uh, but to get a professional writer to turn that into four or five um, articles, you know, there is going to be a cost to that, but it's not actually as expensive uh, as you might think. Uh, once you've actually got the content in place, clearly uh, email is a really cheap way to distribute content. Um, social media, if you're just looking for organic uh, interactions. Uh, but we're seeing an increase in the number of advisors, and I think we touched on this in one of the earlier episodes, um, starting to actually experiment with advertising. Uh, the most common uh, social media platform to advertise on at the moment is Facebook. Um, so hopefully they sort out their stability issues. Um, but following that, uh, LinkedIn is the second most uh, frequently used platform from an ad- advertising perspective, followed by Instagram and then to a lesser extent, uh, Twitter. So um, it's a really around testing, seeing what's working. If you're getting the results, spending a little bit more, but you've really got to be very focused on that return of investments because you could easily just start throwing money at some of these social media platforms and getting actually nothing back in return. Yeah, I would always suggest, as you just said uh, before, that we that, that's the last sort of part of the process, throwing money at, at platforms. But I think um, I think what the uh, the idea around some budget is also around you know, like budgeting some time, budgeting some money to it mm. every every month, like you said. But that consistency, you mentioned the consistency before, and, and that trust factor. I think that the idea of starting something, having a plan, 
and following it through for the year, the two years, those sorts of things, are, uh, that consistency of content actually helps develop trust. Yeah, and it's important to understand that it doesn't have to be the practice principle that's responsible for your content marketing. Um, if it's not a passion of yours, if it's not something you want to do, um, find someone in your practice that does. Uh, so you'll probably find that somewhere in the business, there's someone that loves doing videos, um, particularly if they're younger. We tend to, they've grown up um, on you know WhatsApp, Facebook, and uh, they're happy to do the social media side. And they're probably very happy to talk talk to a camera uh, once a week, but find someone that is interested in it uh, and then commit some budget, both from a time perspective and also from a, a monetary perspective. Fantastic, Matt. Thanks for coming on this particular episode and sharing and talking about content marketing. We look forward to catching you in the next episode where we talk about business strategy. Can't wait.